To our speaker, Dan Swainbank is a historian, former high school and college writing teacher. He writes about national and international history with chapters based in northeastern Vermont. Dan is the author of Mr. Vale is in Town, Theodore N. Vale, AT&T and his Linden Legacy, and that book is here in the collection if you would like to see that. He's on the steering committee of the Northeast Kingdom Habitat for Humanity, and he lives in North Danville. The Far Disease is Dan Swainbank's second book, and it's also available here in the library and um, at, at local bookstores, I think, yeah. uh, Green Mountain Books and Prints. And Boxcar, great. <clears throat> um, in her profile of Dan in the North Star Monthly, writer Sharon Lakey says of him and this book, author Dan Swainbank deserves a medal. There aren't many people who could broach, no less scrutinize a subject so fraught with emotion. His careful and methodic work is an offering of understanding to the local community who has lived with the secrecy and fear surrounding a deadly and tricky genetic disease. It is a disease that has cut a path through a community of associates, friends, and loved ones. Um, and as Dan says in the book, hope seems to be the best drug they have found so far to deal with the disease. Um, if, if you haven't read it, it's available here, you can get your own copy. Um, when you read the chapter on the, the contemporary, well, the chapter through the the 2000s, it's, it reads like a hoo-hoo of people in this town and in Danville, names that we all know, people we all know. Um, many of these people I didn't realize one family group is related to another, but you knew these people, you saw these people, they were owners of businesses in town, and it's uh, kind of devastating to see um, so many of these people in this period who, who we all knew um, succumb to the disease. And I just want to mention all profits from the sale of this book will go toward the search for a cure for ALS at Massachusetts General Hospital, which features prominently in the book. Please welcome Dan Swainbank. I turned up the volume and we'll I can stand here and do a check okay. Okay. to see it. For one side, it's going to have to lean in and be obnoxious. Take my copy? No. Oh, it's back there. I'll get it. It's got my... Well, thank you, Bob. And uh, it is an honor to be here. I've sat out there many times and in the first Wednesday series and the Arts and Culture series, and I've always been very impressed with the scholarship and the credentials of people who stood up here at this podium. Um, I, on the other hand, have no credentials. I'm a high school English teacher turned, in fact, my colleagues, my old high school teaching colleagues were very amused at the, at the label historian, which has been applied to me because they thought my history knowledge was pretty pathetic. <laughs> and uh, I don't have credentials, certainly, in <clears throat> medical history or medical science. But maybe I've done my homework, and I'll, I'll try to make this interesting and tell you it is a sad story, but it's also a very compelling one. So I entitled this talk, Toxic Gene Orphan Disease. And it's the coming together of those two kinds of things, the genetic basis and the inherited nature of this disease in one family over 150 years, and the nature of the particular disease itself. The disease, of course, is ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, known in Europe as motor neuron disease in many cases, many countries. The gene in particular, the defective gene, sometimes referred to as a toxic gene or a rogue gene, uh, is found on chromosome 21. It is a gene which manufactures a protein. It's kind of programmed to have a cleansing effect on cells, and it doesn't work in this case. It is a defective gene. It doesn't do its job, or it overdoes its job. They're not really quite sure. <clears throat> the family in, in question, uh, are referred to as the Farr family in the medical literature. Um, and often also I have found it in lectures and so forth by some of the neurologists that I interviewed and I looked up some of their work. They still talk about them as the Farr family. <clears throat> However, that name uh, has been dotted out quite a couple of generations ago, at least from the Vermont 
my Vermont sources. Um, of the, all of my sources that I interviewed, people in Vermont and Georgia and New Jersey and Virginia, one of them was named Farr, the others had a different name. <clears throat> and they are all cousins and um, aunts and uncles and so forth of the Vermont folks whom you know. The Vermont folks whom you do know would be the Vance family, especially the family of Curtis Vance, who died of ALS in 1999. You might have heard of Dennis Myrick's case in 2012. And then the most recent victim of uh, ALS was Cliff Langmate, who died in 2014. Cliff was quite a quiet man. He did not intend for his story to be on the front page of the Caledonian record, but it, his death coincided with the ice bucket challenge. And so there was a lot of attention given to the disease and a lot of money raised and a lot of understanding, increasing the understanding of the community about what sort of disease it is. The Farr family in Vermont has been in the medical literature since 1880 and has been in and out of touch with specialists in the field, therefore, for over 135 years. Their own family records show early deaths from paralysis, respiratory arrest, and palsy since the 17th century. Today, certain members of the family all around the country are working very actively with the doctors in the vanguard of the search for a cure. I found a, quite a variety and quite a spectrum of involvement and awareness of the disease within the family. I'll, I'll describe that a little bit later. Let's make sure we uh, all understand the disease and give you a little remind you of, about the disease. I would say that ALS as a rare disease is actually fairly well known compared to other rare diseases. If you look at the list of the thousands of diseases that are listed in the Orphan Disease Act of 1963, I think it was, um, a lot of them I don't recognize. I don't understand them at all. But um, ALS probably has a little bit higher profile than some of the other rare diseases. It is um, a progressive neuromuscular disease. It leads to muscle wasting. Its characteristic feature is atrophy of a muscle, particular muscle group and then another and then another. It moves around the body until eventually it results in atrophy and disuse of the respiratory muscles so you can't breathe. Um, it is usually fatal statistically within one to five years. There is no cure. There is no, there's one drug on the market which seems to prolong life, but only for several months. It is not really highly regarded within the family and within the medical profession. It's called Riliotech, and um, most patients do take it, but I've even known several patients in, in this area who didn't bother to take it. So there really is no known treatment of the type which lengthens life. There are a lot of separate medicines and therapies which can deal with separate sy symptoms, but uh, there is no cure and no real treatment. The usual age of onset is f ages 50 to 70 in your 50s or 60s, but the Farr family has seen uh, onset ranging from 24, age 24, uh, up into the 80s. It is a rare or so-called orphan disease because of its low incidence. It affects one to two cases out of every 100,000 people. That leads to about 5,600 cases a year in the United States, 5,600 new cases a year in the United States. And because of the slow, uh, the short uh, survival rate, that leads to only about 30,000 cases. The prevalence of the disease is about 30,000 cases at any one time in the U.S. 90% um, of all cases of ALS are sporadic. They happen in people who have no known family history of the disease. 10% are familial. The familial cases have received a lot of attention for several reasons. One is you can, you can get in touch with these families and know about a, a new onset but also because uh, the familial form of the disease is clinically similar, almost exactly the same as the sporadic form. So they understand, especially if they can get to the genetic basis of the disease, the genetic cause of the disease, if they find a treatment that works in the familial case, then um, it would apply, hopefully, to the 90% of cases which are so-called sporadic in nature. 
the, all of the focus these days is on genetic causes. And um, all of the hope is really lodged in somehow getting to the basic genetic cause of the disease. The family's particular gene, which is called superoxide dismutase, leads to the uh, abbreviation SOD1. So this is referred to as an SOD1 family. It was the first gene linkage discovered in 1993. And for a while, it was the only gene linkage discovered. And so a tremendous amount of attention was given to this particular genetic cause. Uh, today, there are over 30 genetic linkages that have been found. And SOD1 has kind of fallen to second place. There's a particular genetic cause uh, called c 9 orf 72 which is receiving a lot of attention. But a tremendous amount of uh, effort and science had been put into discovering how the SOD1 gene works, so that work continues. One of the results of that research was the creation of generations of mice with the SOD1 gene so that you could try out different treatments on them. Um, when the, shortly after the mice are born, they begin to show symptoms of ALS. To talk a little bit more about the genetics, um, the inheritance pattern is autosomal dominant. That means that you can inherit the gene, the defective gene, from either your mother or your father. Um, and it is, as I said, it's found on chromosome 21. <clears throat> it is the second most prevalent genetic defect among AFLS patients. If you inherit the defective gene, then your chances of getting the disease, if you are a carrier of the disease, your chances, chances of getting the disease are technically 100%. When I asked a doctor, that Dr. Merit Sokovich, that same question, uh, over the phone once, uh, just to make sure I was understanding that right. She said, 100%. Then she said, but that will be the case. You would get ALS only if something else didn't get you first. So if you, if you have some other health problems, including inherited ones, problems that run in the family, um, you might die of something else. We have, in this family's history, in my study, I found three cases of what are called obligate carriers, three women it happens to be, who died of something else, but their child turned out to have ALS, so they knew they were, then they knew they were a carrier. Um, two of them lived to see their child die of ALS. The third one died herself um, at quite an age, but her son, she didn't know her son would get it after she died. Those three women died of at ages 45, 75, and 85, and they were all women. Tenny Toussaint, a kind of a central character in this narrative, who lived in North Dambo, had seven children. She had five daughters and two sons. All five of the daughters were carriers. Three of them, uh, two of them, let's see. Three died of ALS and two carriers of her, of her five daughters. Her two sons did not seem to be carriers of the gene, did not die of ALS, and in fact one of them is, is still alive, the last surviving member of that generation. He's a, uh, a patient at Northeastern Vermont, uh, at uh, St. J. Health and Rehab in his 80s today. There is genetic testing. It is possible at any age to t go through genetic testing and find out whether you have the particular gene. Think about that. It is also possible to have prenatal testing. You can find out whether the seed that you carry is, uh, has the gene. That will lead to some very tough questions and very tough decisions for the family, which we'll talk about in a minute. This family, this particular family, just counting parents, grandparents, and cousins, and uh, brothers and sisters and nephews, just that close a uh, circle, has lost um, a member of the family to their knowledge, you know, in their lifetime, in their awareness. In 1962, 1966, 1975, 
1988, two. 1999, 2001, 2010, 2012, and 2014. Roughly an average of one every five years. They don't all agree within the family on all of those cases as being ALS. And I present both sides of those internal arguments uh, in, in each case. There were two cases in particular where they don't agree within the family. Um, but that gives you an idea of the prevalence, the kinds of things that this particular family has to, to uh, live with. Um, so w when I started talking to Susan Lina and, her, and Mary Pryor, and visiting Mary Pryor and Dennis Myrick to learn about this disease once I kind of had committed to the book. They told me that, to good luck talking to the family. They said, you're going to find a range. You're going to find a full spectrum of people involved with this disease, aware of this disease. And they said that on one end of the spectrum, the far end of the spectrum, I would find deniers. That I would talk to people who would say, I don't agree that there's a pattern within our family. At the other end of the spectrum were the people I was talking to who are totally involved, activists themselves, in touch with doctors at more than one medical center, uh, lending their tissues and their uh, family history to more than one ALS clinic, and really keeping on trial, clinical trials and what's happening in the, in the case, in the various cases within the family and outside the family. I didn't really find deniers. I did find um, people who didn't want to talk to me. Um, and they had a really good argument. I didn't want to linger on the phone too long if they didn't want to talk to me. But essentially, what the one said to me was, um, it's an awful sad subject. I've tried to live without thinking about it every day. I don't go back to Danville. I never will. I'm trying to bring up my kids without this cloud over their head. And I don't want to talk to you. And I said, I understand. Now, so his mom did not seek any other details about her. In another case, um, there was a delightful woman who is the, was the wife of Curtis Vance, uh, herself is a wonderful writer and written a lot about um, Curtis and his case and the family pattern. And she didn't want to talk to me, as I understand it, because she wants to write her own book. And I can understand that, too. Um, and th there was some feeling of other members of the family that this is their story, not my story. Mary Pryor told Sharon Lakey she didn't want to be part of that man's book, uh, and I can certainly understand that. The third case was uh, in Georgia, and I heard from a family member that so-and-so, um, the son of the man who died, would not want to talk to me. After the publication of the book, I actually received a letter from her, his sister saying, how come you didn't interview, interview me for this book? So I, I, I was very sorry about that. I was told by somebody else not to bother. Uh, <clears throat> there is a spectrum of awareness. There is a real lack of education and understanding in some cases. There is a lack of hi historical outlook, not denying, but still not knowing the full picture, the whole full family tree. There is a spectrum of attitudes towards sharing within the family. Some family, their children at a fairly early age become fully aware of the family pattern. Others, again, for very good reasons, try to protect their children from the knowledge and um, hope that it doesn't appear in their branch. There are a number of what I call safe branches. Uh, that's my term. I don't know if it's a medical term, but it seems to be the case in several people who live in the Northeast Kingdom that I have talked to, and uh, one woman came to one of my readings, um, that they know that Grandpa lived a good long life and would have been uh, in jeopardy perhaps, but did not live a good long life and did not die of ALS. And dad did not die of ALS, so they can feel, they can breathe a little easier, they can think that the, the gene was not passed on to their particular branch of the family. The family itself sees patterns. Um, they see uh, some of which I think are valid and others are not um, at a cer certain point. They were convinced, the folks in Danville and North Danville were convinced that the disease had skipped a generation. It really hadn't, but it kind of looked that way to them. 
in some cases it seemed to affect uh, only women. Um, that is until Curtis got sick and then they realized that that was not the case. The family is also very interested in the subject of triggers and in perhaps environmental or other causes. They're looking for an answer to the question of why did Curtis Vance get sick at age 24? And why did Grammy Tenney live a vital active life until she was 79, in which case she may have come down with ALS, symptoms of ALS and may not. And they've looked for various uh, options and triggers which I discuss in the book. There is a lot of interest, there's been some recent articles in the paper you might have seen about uh, triggers, about environmental toxins. Green blue algae in particular is one. Dr. Elijah Stummel at uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock has, has uh, spent part of his career as a neurologist studying environmental effects. Curtis Vance himself was part of a, a, uh, a lawsuit, a class action lawsuit against a, uh, IBM where he was working because there was more than one woman, uh, more than one person, I should say, at IBM who came down with ALS. Karen, Karen, I can't think of her last name, but one of the women that I interviewed said that her husband works in the field of, uh, in turf field, and for mowing grass and keeping landscaping and so forth. And there's a high incidence of ALS among people who use the the herbicides and the pesticides involved in, in turf. She said, I actually know more people who um, died of ALS not outside the family than I do within the family. So there's a tremendous amount of interest in the family in, in how triggering the disease. I think there's some a little bit of change in behavior there. Um, they avoid certain things. Um, but that gives you an idea of the kind of the, I'm trying to give you an idea of the awareness within the family and the levels of activism within the family. But if you are a member of the family, based on what I've told you so far, you can imagine the difficult things that you have to think about. And using my imagination, these are some of the questions that I would have when I grew to adulthood in this family or grew to an awareness of it. First of all, where am I on the family tree? You know, who above me on the tree or below me, however you imagine the tree, um, died of ALS and seems to be a carrier or a victim of the disease? Where am I on the tree? Tell me about Grammy Tenney, uh, Grandma Clara, Clara, Wilhelmina, and so forth. What are my odds? Given my age, when might symptoms begin? Do I not have to worry about it in my 20s and 30s and 40s? In most cases, you, you don't. What do I tell my girlfriend, my boyfriend, my fiance, um, if I know that I'm not, I'm de definitely not on a safe branch of the family? Should I have children? Should I get tested? And if I get tested, do I want to know? Among the people that I've talked to and know about within this family, only two members of the family have gone to get have genetic testing to find out whether they carry the gene. It's the woman in Virginia and a woman over in Jericho, Vermont. They also both had their children tested. But to my knowledge, none of the real local people have wanted to be tested for good reason, or not want it. Sometimes they have, a lot of them have been tested in the sense that they've given their tissues to science, but they don't want to know. If there's no cure, and if it, even if I test positive, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to get it because it didn't seem to get to Grammy so and so or Aunt so and so, uh, do I really want to know? Can I take any steps to prevent it? I get, as I said, there's this interest in triggers and environmental factors. How do I live my life? Should I start my bucket list now? Should I think about this every day or somehow try to put it out of my mind every day? How do I live my life? What are my interests? What are my priorities? Do, should I have children, of course, is a key one. And how much do I want to know about the disease? Do I want to be an expert? Do I want to be an activist? 
I was kind of surprised at how few people were active, really active. Um, I remember having lunch with a woman named Wendy Kolb in Allentown, New Jersey, and she said, I know very little about this, and I'm embarrassed to say that. Um, and a number of the members of the family said, I can't wait to read your book, find out about my family. Um, but others say, such as Mary Pryor, say to anyone who listen and to themselves and to their spouse, I don't want to be defined by this. I'm going to live my life as long and as well as I can and as energetically according to my priorities as I can, but I don't want to be defined by this. Uh, if you want me to be in a clinical trial, I will. If you want me to help raise money at the annual events, I will. But um, I don't want to be part of this guy's book, <laughs> and I, I don't want this to be my legacy. At Mary Pryor's funeral, ALS was not mentioned at all. At Dennis Myrick's funeral, it was. I could, I could. How's this? Okay. Thanks. Um, I began working on this as a book in 2010. It's been a labor of love and admiration. I got quite involved with this family, probably in some cases more than they wanted to see me coming to their door. I knew going ahead that this was a story that many people know. As I said, a lot of three or four of the members of this family were quite public in sharing their, their progress of their disease. Uh, Curtis Vance, in particular, had prayer circles in his house once a week for months, attended by 30, 40 more people, and a number of newspaper articles written about him. Same with Dennis Myrick. Dennis Myrick wanted, was very happy to be on the front page of the Calderon record if it would um, if it would help bring attention to this disease. Uh, I began to have lunch with Susan Lina LSC, and I knew at the time in 2010 that Mary Pryor and Dennis Myrick were ill with the disease. So I had found the story to be compelling, and I decided that if I was going to get involved in it and writing it, I better start because I could have an opportunity to sit with Mary Pryor and, and Dennis Myrick, and I did, and I really am grateful for them They're willing to have me come into their house. In the end, I sat with uh, four different patients, three in the family and one outside the family. When I decided that it could be a book was based on two stories. One was the story of the, of the, that I didn't know about. One was the story of the young Sutton farmer, 43-year-old Sutton farmer, who went somehow in 1880, made his way to Montreal. Um, Erastus Farr uh, was a, described by Dr. William Osler, the, the, man, the surgeon, the doctor that he met with in Montreal, as a big, strong man. Came to Montreal somehow in 1880. That was kind of one mystery that I never solved. How did he get there? And he was very likely a, a subsistence farmer without a lot of money. But he made his way to a major med medical center in Montreal. And he met with Dr. William Osler, who would go on to be extremely famous worldwide physician, one of the fathers of American medicine, certainly um, the author of the most widely used textbook, a medical textbook, that uh, doctors all had to study right up until uh, recent years, actually. And Osler was a, a prolific author. He, it seems to me from reading his biography that he rarely had a case that he didn't turn into an article. And uh, that was the case with Erastus Barr. The other story that um, Susan told me that I thought was compelling was a story that's told within the family about Tenny Toussaint, Susan's grandmother, learning more and more about the family facts of disease. And one day in 1963, while Charlie Myrick was watching, she threw a folder of records into the wood stove. Trying to figure out that event, my sense of it is that she wanted to share that, she wanted to collect that knowledge because she was a very curious and intelligent woman. She wanted to be aware and serious about it, but she wanted to somehow protect her family. 
And so she did both. I think she corrected, collected a lot of information. She is credited as an essential source by Dr. Madeline Brown, who wrote an article about the family in 1951. But what seemed to have happened, and I think this pattern exists in some other branches of the family, they wanted to be clear-eyed and knowledgeable about the disease, but somehow not share it with the family and protect it from the rest of the family. Those two stories and that issue of what do you share, what do you do, what decisions do you make, made me think that this could be a book, and so I continued working with it. In addition, there are several compelling incidents along the way. A third one that really kind of made me think that for a short while, for about a year, that this book might have a happy ending was a phone call I got from Susan Lina in 2011, in which she said she had just gotten back from Massachusetts General Hospital, where she and her sister had met with, um, with Dr. Merit Sokovich at Mass General. Dr. Sokovich on that day had been particularly ebullient, and even in her dress, they thought there was something different about her. And Dr. Sokovich said to them, I think we've got something here. We are going to start a, a clinical trial early of a new therapy called anti-sense therapy. It may be too late for Mary, but the way she said, and, and she later repeated the same phrase to Dennis Myrick, whom she also treated, the way she put it was, your children will not have to go through this. And that really gave the family a tremendous amount of hope immediately for Mary, but that hope still exists today. I was doing a little online research today just to give you an update. That particular compound, the anti-sense therapy, was produced by a pharmaceutical firm in California named ISIS, which has since changed its name. <laughs> I believe it's now they decide, let's not call ourselves ISIS. <laughs> We're, they're called Ionis. And that particular therapy, they are partnering with a gigantic pharmaceutical firm called Biogen. And they are launching a, a, re, uh, a relaunch of that trial. That trial that Susan described to me did happen in 2011 and 12, I believe it was. It was a successful phase one trial, which is just to test it out for um, tolerability and safety. Then they kind of went back to the lab, reformulated the compound, and just last month, they announced the start of a new trial at phase one and two um, for this anti-sense therapy, which I, I'm, I'm, I'm on the edge here, but uh, anti-sense therapy deals with RNA and reprogramming of genes. I better leave it at that. That's about all I know. Um, The family, uh, many of you know the family. They are a wonderful family. They are outgoing. They are very prominent in Danville and North Danville and Dennis Myrick and St. Johnsbury. Um, they're very active. Uh, as I said, they have different attitudes toward this family history and this disease and toward this book. But um, they have, <coughs> in general, have a wonderful sense of humor, kind of a, kind of a dry sense of humor. Um, if you've ever been to one of Craig Vance's auctions, you know this. he's got a great quick wit. And um, they are living their lives under this shadow, but with courage and good humor. As I said, few have been tested. They are much in demand as an SOD1 family. Linda Vance, I believe, has made trips in recent months to Mass General, to Emory University in Georgia, and to University of Miami and they are always doing whatever they can. As an SLD1 family, they're much in demand, <clears throat> and it's possible that more than one medical center would want to know their history and perhaps look at their genetic profile. The book, um, as it turned out, has about seven different strands which I weave together in a chronological narrative, in addition to the family of the story and a history of the disease and a history of the medical advances. I also uh, uncovered three celebrity patients. My thinking there was that um, somebody like Lou Gehrig would have a lot of biographies written about him, and some one of those biographies would have talked about the medical issues. So I, I found three uh, patients in different eras for whom that was the case. The first was a German-Jewish philosopher named Franz Rosenzweig, 
who wrote eloquently about what it's like to have ALS and what treatments he went through. The second was Lou Gehrig. And the third was Vice President Henry A. Wallace, who was Roosevelt's third term vice president, his second vice president, his third term vice president, who died of ALS in 1975, after, well after leaving office. And Wallace, um, Rosenzweig, um, Rosenzweig's biography was actually very much closer to an autobiography. It contains a lot of Rosenzweig's own writing and his own thinking. And uh, Wallace wrote a wonderful six-page essay entitled Reflections of an ALSer. Uh, which kind of picks up his story when he began to be treated at the National Institutes of Health. And Wallace was really quite a, a scientist and a thinker and um, a very positive man. And uh, so I got, I got that uh, little five-page essay from his family, which I really appreciated, and I that excess of it from the book. In addition, um, there is a bit of a primer on the subject of ALS. Well, I wanted to break that up since it's such a uh, hard, hard go to go through the stages of ALS. Uh, so I broke that up. And they appear as inter intercalary chapters, intercalary sections between chapters. So I kind of break it up, but it's told chronologically from early symptoms through diagnosis to early treatments and caregiving and genetic testing and the type of things that it might have person might, the stages that a person will go through who has ALS. How are we doing? Okay. I'm just going to read a few selections, then I'd be happy to entertain a discussion. That would be great. So here's the introduction. Here's Erastus. In September of 1880, a 47-year-old farmer from Sutton, Vermont, named Erastus Farr, somehow made his way to Montreal in the offices of Dr. William Osler at McGill University. Mr. Farr went to Montreal, hopefully for treatment of symptoms of progressive muscular atrophy, described by Osler as, quote, a tall, large-boned man of exceptional muscular development. Erastus Farr had been a hard worker, never seriously ill, but several months after visiting, before visiting Dr. Osler, he had noticed twitching of the muscles in his left buttocks and thigh, and then his left leg had become progressively weaker, and as Dr. Osler observed, considerably smaller than his right leg. Quote, in walking, the patient requires the use of a stick and drags his left leg very much, Osler later wrote in an article, which he entitled, Heredity and Progressive Muscular Atrophy is Illustrated in the Farr Family of Vermont. In the article, Osler reported on the case of Mr. Farr and of his family. Erastus Farr remained in the Montreal Hospital for a month and received treatments of electric current. Dr. Osler noted little benefit to the patient, although the patient said he did feel better. That's a little hard to imagine, too, isn't it, to be in the hospital for a month in Montreal? Must be that Canadian health care system, I don't know. <laughs> In the view in grass as far, however, for, of his, for his family history, Dr. Osler learned that Erastus was not the first of his family to be afflicted with these symptoms. In fact, 13 individuals in two generations had been affected, nine of whom had died, including Erastus' father, an uncle and aunt, Erastus' own brother and sister, and four cousins. In addition to himself, Erastus reported his brother Wesley, from whom all my sources uh, follow. At age 42, was showing symptoms and two other cousins. The disease had decimated his family. Dr. Osha concluded his article as, as this. Thus, of the 13 members of the family affected, six were females and seven males, a larger proportion of the former than it's com is common in this disease. With the exception of two, all the cases occurred are proved fatal above the age of 46. Of the 10 instances in the second generation, five are offspring of males, Erastus and Samuel, and five are offspring of females, Mrs. Spencer and Mrs. Stoddard. The disease has not yet appeared in the third generation, which promises between 40 and 50 individuals, several of whom are over 30 years of age. Erastus Farr, Dr. Oslo's patient, died in September 1881 
one year after seeing the doctor. Another story that I uncovered that, that my Danville, North Danville sources did not know about was the story of Frank Farr, Frank Leslie Farr. And um, I, I stumbled on this story because at a certain point in my thinking and writing, I began, began to try to attack the question of what did Tenny Toussaint know? What did she burn? What did, was in that folder? And I said to myself, well, what about her uncle? Her uncle's name was Frank Leslie Farr. He died in uh, Montpelier, I think, in 1932. Tenny would have been herself about 38 at that time. She must have known about her uncle. And so I tried to find out about Frank Leslie Farr, and I knew a distant relative of hers, of his, was this woman that I'd met in Virginia, named Michelle Farr. So I said, what can you tell me about Frank? This is quite a story. Born in Sutton, Frank had become a farmer, had been a farmer all his life. He was listed as farmer in 1895 when he married Della Wilson of Wheelock. At some point, he moved from Caledonia County to the Montpelier area where he continued in farming. He and Della had four children. According to his grandson, however, due to the stigma associated with the family disease, when Frank became ill in 1931, he disappeared from view. And in fact, the family was told, he is taken off to Alaska with a mistress. <laughs> Apparently, a scandal of adultery and desertion was preferable as a narrative <laughs> to the curse of familial ALS. His children and many of his grandchildren were unaware of the family disease until concern, contacted by family activists years later. One granddaughter, whom I talked to, learned of the family pattern by doing basic online genealogical research and finding references to this far disease. She said that she grew up knowing quite a bit about her mother's relatives, but that her father's side of the family, the far side, was always a mystery. The woman's name is Bonnie Lavenberg, and she came to my first reading in September and uh, uh, kind of kept in touch. Um, I'll give you a little bit of, of Henry Wallace's um, essay on how to on reflections of an ALSer. It was the case in both the literature that I read about uh, in Rosenzweig's case and in Wallace's case, but also in Curtis Vance's case that that some patients find a peace fairly quickly and they don't really seek extra treatment or prolong their life. They just find a summer peaceful moment. In the case of uh, Kelly Ralston in Georgia, it was a matter of faith. He, he, he left his hands in the hands of God, left his body in the hands of God. In the case of Curtis, he rediscovered the mountains and the landscape from Danville and just enjoyed it. And this is Wallace. Wallace was philosophical about the disease and recorded his feelings and observations in familiar terms. <clears throat> he wrote, truly ALS is a unique experience. There is no pain. Apparently your eyes and brain are not affected. Therefore you can calmly watch the rest of your body slowly disintegrate, moving from the left leg to certain muscles in the left arm, then no muscles in the cheeks, very few in the tongue and throat. After a year of ALS, you begin to feel a little like a disembodied spirit in purgatory. Of course, you come back to the earth with a bump when you try to walk or talk or eat. The amazing thing is how many people come to see you. Different people have different attitudes in calling on sick people. A great many bring books for you to read. Apparently, the idea is to give you more handles to this world so that you will not slip away for lack of interest. ALS gives you a ringside seat at your own dissolution. With a clear mind, you consider left life and death and the eternal verities. This ALSer has had a rich experience with the goodness of man as exhibited toward those who are unfortunate. Hey, did you get any insight that you can share about that uh, way of approaching old age and 
versus the more frequent way with dementia but a perfectly healthy body. Those two extremes are so dynamically opposed. You don't want either, but did you get insights as to which one is more manageable for the person involved? Among the, the people that I, uh, that I interviewed regarding this disease and the readings that I have done, uh, I found a lot of this attitude. Some, something happens. Um, one of the profiles that I did in my talk about uh, I images of patients, types of patients in the public mind was the philosopher. And you might remember uh, Mitch Albom's book, Tuesdays with Maury and Maury Schwartz. And you might have heard uh, Terry Gross's interview with Tony Judd just a few years ago who also was a historian, a man with terrific erudition and historical perspective. And um, they speak of no regrets. They speak of uh, um, a very peaceful end to life this way, accepting their fate. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but that is one of the attitudes. And I didn't find too many of the of the others. Um, I admire the others, like Dennis Myrick, you know, he's going to fight it to the end. Um, but I found really mo probably more cases of this public, uh, this private, and the same was true of Lou Gehrig too. Very, very quiet, just has saw a few people toward the end of his life and didn't really describe himself as being panicky or miserable. I don't, I don't know if that's on the topic. Either. You know, I was looking. Has, I, I didn't realize that he has ALS, but he has a different form of ALS. He, he does. In fact, today I was looking in this wonderful patient guide that I got, which is um, the, the best book that I have found for for the patient for patients and for the lay people. But it was very thick and very authoritative, and it's got a lot of different chapters written by different experts. And um, Stephen Hawking is not mentioned in that book, to my surprise. Um, and I found a few references to him. I, I, just, I studied lists of notable people who had ALS published by the ALS Association. And that's where I got Rosenzweig and Wallace and others. And Hawking is mentioned, but his case is very anomalous, very, very different. He's ALS. It's still, they still think it's ALS, mm -hmm. um, but it's a really different sort of thing. He's had it for over 50 years. Yeah. And in terms of the public awareness of the of the, the image of the brilliant mind encased in a dysfunctional body, a racked body. Um, he's a very prominent figure in people's imaginations. Um, and in fact, wouldn't you say, we didn't know Stephen Hawking, weren't aware of Stephen Hawking before he was Stephen, the one who has ALS, right? I mean, a few people in the cosmology might have known about him in the sciences, but for most of the public's awareness of Stephen Hawking, he's, he's that guy with ALS. So it's a very, very, very rare case, extremely rare. And there are other types of rare. There's a juvenile form, which is very rare. And there is a different uh, clusters in various um, other locales, including a kind of a, a form of ALS with dementia, especially found in the, uh, in the Pacific Southwest. Right. Um, it's very prominent. It's very promising. Right now, there is no, uh, I, I'm speaking out of turn here, but um, there is no promising therapy at phase three in clinical trial. There is nothing, as, as I looked them up today, there's a lot of them, but in the, when I check websites for the ALS Association and the ALS Therapy Development Institute in, in, uh, in Cambridge, and I went to a leadership summit in November in Boston. There's nothing on the market right now or in the, in the pipeline that is at phase three 
that is ready, that has really created a lot of excitement. But there's a tremendous amount of excitement about gene therapy, stem cell therapy, this antisense therapy, the therapies that are very promising at that level, of the level of DNA, RNA, cell um, molecules. Um, it, it, uh, if you look at why well, I look today just to see if there's any latest news, you know, on the websites of the ALS Association, and there's, there's not that much that, that is about to happen. The other thing that seems to be happening is firms like Biogen, when they bet on something, when they invest in something, that tells you that, that you know, they're, they're not in this for charity, they're in this for success. And when Biogen drops some of its other lines to focus on neurological issues, and when Biogen gets in touch with Ionis, which used to be ISIS, and says to Ionis, can we partner with you? That's a big deal. Uh, the last big, most promising trial was a Biogen trial of a drug called Dexpramapexol. And when I went to the ALS Leadership Summit in 2012, I think it was, that was the big talk. And every time somebody from the audience would ask a question of this panels of experts, they'd say, well, we got our fingers crossed on DEX. But DEX didn't work. It failed. But Biogen gets a tremendous amount of credit within the industry for spending millions of dollars giving it a try. And so if they're willing to try something else, uh, that causes a lot of excitement. And you can gauge excitement by mentions in the ALS press, but also by mentions on on Wall Street and uh, Wall Street Journal when it talks about this particular thing. When investors come forward, then there's, that gives patients hope if they're paying attention. Um, gene therapy hit a terrible um, drought for a while because of the death of a particular patient. Gene therapy had a lot of uh, currency uh, a few years ago. And uh, they made a mistake in the early trials, and a, a man, young man died. So the whole concept, the whole theory was put on the shelf, but now it's back. When I asked Merit Sukovich to suggest, uh, asked her if she'd write a little blurb for my book, she mentioned gene therapy. As one, the gene therapy and antisense therapy are the two things that she's betting on. I could read another section, but this is excellent. Uh, why don't we take some more questions? Yes, sir. How did the families interact with the medical community in the local area, if at all? Was there, were there physicians interested in this, these families and, or palliative care or some, some connection, or is it simply a passing? Um, it's been mixed. Um, they felt in several cases that the diagnosis was way too slow, and they had to kind of pull rank. Um, that's both with the local doctors and also with Dartmouth Hitchcock. The family's history with DHMC is not great. Um, in a couple of cases, they asked for an appointment and they were put off six months, and they, their action, reaction to that was, we don't have six months. So they called MGH, Mass General, and said, tell them you're a fire. And they got an appointment within days. But Dr. Tanner in, in Danville, Sharon Fine in Danville, Dr. Ajami, um, uh, Dr. Sarah Berrien, have played a very interesting and helpful role with the family in being their local provider, checking in on them, monitoring their care. And uh, they speak very highly of the local, local uh, um, practitioners. <clears throat> Kurt uh, Cliff for a while was uh, visiting also with uh, a neurologist at, uh, MG, at uh, no Northeastern Vermont. Um, but his real treatment, and if you're afar and you've got connections over the telephone to MGH, then that's where you go pretty quickly, Mass General. As a physician, Very frustrated too. There's nothing they can really do beyond the palliative care sort of thing right now. So I just beyond we're, palliative we're care, yeah. From talking to yeah. Physicians. They're very involved in palliative care, um, and they are also simply making sure things are coordinated that that that, um, that the, the patients are getting the appointments that they need in Boston or or Hanover. Yeah. 
or Lebanon. Any other questions? And did you talk to Mary Pryor? Is the detail in the book is there, there's a lot of detail about Mary, but did she not want to talk to you? She she was she was okay talking to me. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I wish I had visited her more. I was becoming quite fond of her, and it was it wasn't unpleasant to visit her. She she was a great gal, and um, I only heard later that she didn't want to talk to me. She didn't really show it when <laughs> when we when we got together. Yeah, and um, she she went too quickly. I didn't think there was time, but all of a sudden I heard she'd gone. She left behind a whole stack of clippings, which I really appreciated that she had collected over the years. Any other questions? Did you say earlier there were different family strains of, um, were the genes different in other occurrences of it within? Not within the fires. Not within the fires, but right. with other? With others, family? yeah. Yep. So the genes are, are they different genes? They're different genes. There are over 30 different genetic linkages that have been found. The two most prominent being the SOD1 and this other one called C9 ORF72, which is more prevalent. So when they do these trials, that, that puts into a complication. It does, right. right. This IONIS trial, that IONIS biogen trial that I mentioned, um, is an SOD1 trial. It's they're, they're interested in recruiting SOD1 patients who are already showing symptoms. Um, I had several interesting talks with a genetic counselor from Northwestern. Um, a woman named Lisa Kinsley, and I said, do you have your fire families? And she said, oh yes, we have our family groups out here in the Midwest that they oriented toward our medical center. And um, some are SOD1 families and some are other genetic linkages. And they, she said, oh yes, we, they keep family trees, they, they make telephone calls, they check in. It's a sad process because you're calling a family and saying, in effect, any, anyone sick. Did you ever get connected to the Marshfield complex that wasn't so much blood-related as neighborhood-related? No, I didn't write about that one. <clears throat> this Dr. Stummel uh, from Dartmouth-Hitchcock um, found a cluster around Mascoma Lake in Enfield, Canaan, and uh, is studying that. I called him one night. He gave me his home phone. I called him one night. And he said, "Yeah, I just talked to the Connecticut Association of Ponds and Lakes." So he is he is pursuing that the uh, green algae. Um, well, there are about seven or eight relative neighbors just uh, east of Marshfield Village that Dr. Fowler was uh, following over the course of 15 or 20 years after a plane wreck on the side of Mac Mountain, or right, right close to Mac Mountain. I did not know about that. And some, some of UVM students 10 years ago were doing research on that during summer internships. Yeah. And I don't think it blossomed in anything, or we would have been hearing about it. Uh, Stummel's research into BMAA, this green algae bacteria, follows an outbreak of ALS-like disease in Guam after World War II, which caused a tremendous amount of interest uh, for bio, uh, echo, echo biologists, um, which was traced to their diet, which was flying bats. Um, and they discovered the high concentrations of this particular toxic bacteria in them. It's the same BMAA stuff. Yeah. Fruit bats, yeah, yeah. The story was that the, the Japanese conquered Guam and they took away all the food so that the Chamorro people of Guam went back to their original hunting practices. You talked about um, prenatal testing. There was prenatal testing now. Yes. Um, have you found? Uh, that that has been something that people are, um, whose families have got this gene are really actually using that? Uh, I don't know of anyone in, in the Farr family. Right. This Lisa Kinsley said that it is extremely rare, but it does happen. What's rare? 
uh, that, that someone would re request genetic testing of uh, pre prenatal. Because well, then there's, there's there's just obvious. Families have children, grandchildren. I mean, you know, I was yes. just curious as to and, and their grandchildren are now of childbearing age. I was wondering if that was right. something that any of them had actually talked about. Not that I know of in the Farr family. Um, in fact, I don't know of anyone in the Farr family also who has chosen not to have children, and this being the reason. There are a number, and I asked uh, Susan and Linda and others, uh, there are a number of, I can see on the family tree, of, of young um, childbearing age couples um, who haven't had children, but I don't know if that's the reason. Um, and in some cases, um, uh, one gentleman told me, I, <laughs> he said, no, I, I, I don't have children. My wife and I don't have children, but that's not the reason. The reason is that I play in a country western band and I didn't want to have to raise children on the side. <laughs> Chuck Longchamp of Burke Hall. Yes, yes I, I thought I heard you say, correct me if I'm wrong, that there were several people that you mentioned who were exposed to certain chemicals in the in the environment in which they worked? Yes. And what were those chemicals? I, I only know them as heavy metals. Heavy metals. I, I don't know. Uh, Curtis Vance worked at IBM, mm -hmm. and another woman named Lyons from, uh, or Lyon from Danville. They both worked at IBM. They were both part of this class action lawsuit, and it had to do with exposure to heavy metals triggering ALS. I never was able to get through to get to get this. It would have been classified documentation, and I, I couldn't get to it, so I mm. didn't get anything from the families or from IBM on that. But um, both families said confirmed that 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 was the case. Mm. IBM was good to them. IBM uh, made a fair settlement with them, not really without really any proof of cause and effect. on how frequently that gene mutates. It, you know, we're talking about a family which has a recorded history going back several generations where that gene has all, already changed and it's been passed along. But how about families where uh, suddenly ALS appears? Uh, is it the same gene that's mutated and how often does that happen? I don't, I can't give you any information about that. I know I, you, it's a valid topic, though, because I have read about several families who noticed a pattern recently. They don't have this 150-year history. They noticed a pattern recently. In addition, I keep hearing references. In the latest manuals and so forth, I don't see it, but I keep hearing references that that 90-10 figure is going to change. With our knowledge now of genetic testing and, and DNA um, testing, we, um, that number will change, and the more people who have been considered sporadic will turn out to have had a genetic cause. But I don't, I don't know much more than that, Pat. Do you plan to continue research on this topic? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm staying in touch. Um, I published this book with a, not a lot of confidence about the science. <laughs> Um, and I uh, was pretty nervous about the reaction in September and October when it first came out. But I since have received some really nice emails from Dr. Sokovich and Dr. Robert H. Brown from UMass, who is the gentleman whose team discovered the, this gene in 1993. And in his last email, Dr. Brown said, I want you to stay, I want to keep you informed. In particular, let's watch gene therapy and something else that he, he thought were, were promising. He said he'd keep me in touch, keep in touch. Now, is gene therapy actually extracting? Because uh, I've heard about this thing called CRISPR, <coughs> which was ex extracting part of it gene and, yeah. and, and engineering something else in the face of it. That's, that, that's, that's not the same thing. That's what I was really I think it. I think it, that is what it's all about. It's the introduction of gene replacement therapy by means of a virus or vector. That's so special to 
technique for removing a gene and replacing it with uh, right. another, right. another that's non-defective. Right. But it's not allowed in uh, humans. It's because it can make you can do all kinds of changes, you know, and it can be used for yes. like it's going to be very controversial. Choice of, like the designer job. Yeah, designer, designer yes. genes. Right. But, but they are allowed in some very restricted forms. It's interesting. Um, I tried this idea out on a couple of my sources, um, but uh, if you think of yourself as a research neurologist with a particular interest in ALS, and you graduate from medical school and you do your residency or your internship or all, all of that, and then you're ready to start your career, you're already 30-something years old, right? And Bob Brown was in college with me a year ahead of me, and I, I said to him, how many chances do you have, really, to kind of pursue a course, to pursue a particular therapy? And he, sa he said, that's why I'm still working. He, he said, he said, you're retired and I'm still working because I feel like we're close and I feel I got this one more chance. And he was referring to, um, and he'd like to follow through on his discovery in 1993 of the original gene, so he'd like to be the guy who finds a cure, although he's a very modest and soft-spoken man. But um, he, he, he said, um, I don't have much time left. To, to you know, to be practicing, but he's betting on gene therapy. Something else too, I forget what he said. Might have been anti-sense. Well, thank you very much for the discussion. It was excellent. My lovely assistant will be selling.